But we're going to start, Leah, with that the first slide of the boat shuttle, because as well as loving tools, I love language. And when we started talking about tools we might use for this experience, I said shuttle, and it brought up weaving shuttle. And this boat shuttle is from the collect collection. It's got the incised hearts on, on both sides of the spindle opening, but it wasn't exactly what I was talking about. And you know, that is so common in um, uh, textile tools, in fiber arts. The language is based upon where you come from, uh, what language you're speaking. And many people who can speak the language of weaving don't speak the language that's used, but they're talking about specific tools and, and other language users can infer what they were talking about. But um, we're going to start with a different type of shuttle. First things first, though, my, my love of tools, and I've lost my view of myself here, so I, I'm not real sure if you can see this or not. Uh, with my babysitting money, I bought myself an, a pair of embroidery scissors many, many years ago, and I still treasure them because I, I do love tools. So something with a little bit of carving and the beauty of this boat shuttle would totally rock my world if I were a loom weaver, and I'm not. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, Leah, I, uh, I work primarily in single element construction. This is a netting shuttle. Um, so unlike the boat shuttle that would be thrown across the warp threads uh, of an open shed in a loom, this shuttle would be loaded. And I don't know if you can see my, my screen right now. Are you seeing it? Anybody out there? Yeah. Um, I can flip to it. Yes, Donna. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, it would be loaded with thread and the entire working thread would be passed through on each stitch in a single element construction. Um, a needle, a shuttle like this for making netting would be used to carry that long thread. Um, you can see the, the, the little tongue that sticks out in the opening and the heel at the base of the, of the shuttle. It's, if, you're, if you can see this, I'll hold up two so you can see one loaded and one unloaded. Maybe you can see that. Um, and the, um, it's, a, it's an elegant use of a, a design to be able to hold a fairly large amount of material while you're working. Leah's got a little video to play here um, to show the process of, of netting. Actually, I think this is Leah's son who's doing our video today. Thank you. So, and this is an old style of making a sheet bend knot where the, the shuttle passes uh, through the mesh of the previous row. And then I'm using a gauge, that piece of wood at the bottom to make all of the meshes on the row I'm working consistent in size. I, <laughs> I married into a fishing family. And when my husband started making fishing nets, his one of his fishing buddies said, "So is Donna gonna make net the the net sacks for all your all of your nets?" And I thought, "Huh, I wonder is Donna gonna make all the net sacks for all of your fishing nets?" And I got out my mother's old Good Housekeeping Encyclopedia of Needlework and started trying to teach myself how to do netting. Um, and the next uh, image here, I don't make them all for fishing by any means. Although when I have a, a net hanging out off of the porch in the winter time with fleece that I have scoured uh, drying out there, Bill's fishing friends all make rude comments and they, they think it's a waste of netting time, but it works perfectly as a tool for much of what I do. And much of what I do is uh, I will 
buy a fleece from a local grower and scour that fleece. And if you want to go to the next um, slide, I have some nets that I have made that are um, the right size to scour a dish pan full of fleece. Um, and I have other nets that I have made, you know, into bag shapes that are the right size. If you want to go to the next slide to um, stick into a dye pot or I don't know if you can see right now. This one has been dyed in homegrown indigo um, and then uh, I mortared it and I'm going to over dye it with some goldenrod to make a green. It's a handy, handy tool that's made with another tool. Um, and much of what we're going to be talking about today is like that. Now, this is another type of tool that fits right into the fishing theme of, I'm, I truly believe that you can start a conversation about the history of the world with fishing, and it will apply no matter where your people came from. This is a hand-blown glass uh, fishing float from the museum collection. And when I saw this in the, in the collection um, the first time, I was just so excited to see it. Um, it. This is simple looping. Can you see to the left of the ball, there is kind of a, a, a break in the pattern, a line. Um, there's basically an anchor line around that part of the ball and simple looping that comes off in one direction and simple looping that goes off in the other direction. And um, the, the larger piece of looping is turned into then um, a, a hook, um, but it all encases this glass float. Now for, for thousands of years, people have used wood or cork for floating fishing nets. In other words, uh, a net like what you first saw my fleece drying in would be stretched out and the the, um, the float would keep one end of the net up and the other part would be weighted down so that fish would would uh, swim into the into the net. Well, Norway and uh, we're, you know, we're the Vesterheim's uh, uh, celebration of all things. Um, Norway was Norway was the first country to start production and use of glass fishing floats. So that was around 1840. And the replacement of the more um, perishable uh, wood and cork. Um, I'm, I find it really interesting when we see things that have changed as other materials and tools have become available. So the glass blowing technology that was adopted and now um, we're pretty much past that too because a lot of places, Japan made, made there are many, many uh, treasured glass floats that came from Japan, but Norway started it. And so this would be simple looping, a uh, single element construction with a, uh, a thick cord that was probably hand twisted, but I'm not sure. Um, moving on to uh, another form of single element construction. This is a hat that I made from hand spun wool yarn. So we're taking the same type of techniques, but we're introducing additional uh, connections, so to speak. So where a simple looping might intersect with the previous row and cross over itself. Here we have multiple intersections, possibly with the previous row and the current row, um, and many different stitch possibilities that we can use. So null bending is what brought me to Vesterheim in the first place. I'd been looping for many years, but I could not get the hang of no bending on my own. I learned embroider and netting and many other things from, from books. Um, but the way that I stitch uh, no bending, it's three dimensional. So you're always looking at a different plane. And I just, my brain just could not translate that from a two dimensional uh, uh, illustration into three dimensional. So I came to Vesterheim and took a class with uh, Kate Martinson. 
And it absolutely rocked my world. I had so much fun with Kate and all the other uh, people who were no bending. And then I started looking at some of the uh, the more recent history. And so uh, uh, Leah has a little clip from a video from the uh, uh, Norsk Folk Museum that will show, uh, and I don't actually know the date of this video, but show the hands of someone doing um, a stitch that doesn't tension around the thumb. So it looks like we're, there we go. So we have a no bending needle and we're going to talk more about the materials she is probably using a little bit later and we'll we'll come back to this video a couple of times to see uh uh some of the inspirations for things that uh that we've been working on and um that really peg my toolometer um which doesn't take i mean i just i just find it beautiful to watch her hands and follow the path of the needle and grateful to the filmmakers who who did this for us um, um, so that we have this visual record of this now as we go on to the next slide which is um, i want to talk a little bit in addition to the tool the the um we have a lot of variations in the way no bending tools are made not only in materials but also in their size and uh width diameter the placement of the whole now i'm i'm going this is one from the collection um Notice the difference in, if I had a pointer, I, I can't stop myself from pointing on my own screen, but it will help you. Um, the difference, thank you. <laughs> the difference in, in the width of this needle from the tip through this area back to the eye where the thread or the yarn comes through. So for certain types of techniques, the stitching would be tensioned around the needle rather than around the thumb. And this needle would give you a lot of variations. And I, I just love that it's a um, indicative of how much our, uh, our forefathers and foremothers would make one tool do many things and be really uh, flexible to different purposes. Um, if you want to go to the, to the um, next slide, this is a pair of mittens that I made this winter. Um, using a mill spun four ply commercial yarn that I had uh, dyed with, I think it was walnut and then um, over dyed with some homegrown indigo. So for, for something like this, um, I wanted a really thick mitten. So I'm choosing a stitch that gives me that thickness. And then I cheat if Kate is here, I, I, I cheat big time because I don't, I very, very rarely full or felt anything after because I really like to be able to see the stitch structure itself. Um, and so many of the needles that I use myself um, would be based upon the size of this yarn and the uh, the stitch that I want to make. And yet we have a an artifact from the museum, the black needle that you just saw, that's completely flexible to do a lot of different things and probably fits the owner's, fit the owner's hand perfectly. Um, if we can go to the next slide then, this would be an antler needle. And it's a relatively recent one, uh, made in 2015. Um, oh, Jennifer, you're gonna have to help me. Uh, Eliza Novacek Olson? I think is the is the uh, the maker who yeah. donated it to the museum, mm -hmm. okay. um, and she carved it from uh, deer antler. Um, how different this is from the needle that we saw previously, the black one with the uh, uh, 
the placement of the whole. And I'm a big believer that it is what fits your hands and allows you the most comfortable um, way to control thread. And that's what, what people love. Look at that beautiful indentation right about where the thumb would go. And this would, I would assume rest perfectly in the palm of her hand. Now, if you can, um, can you, can you make it so I can see my screen, um, Jennifer or Leah? Can you, oh, I don't, I'm not seeing my screen. Oh, here I am now, now in the little corner here. So this is my favorite, absolute favorite needle, period. This was made by uh, Lindsay Lee, who lives in the Decora area, and um, uh, learned no bending also with Kate Martinson. Um, and this has this beautiful coal rosing uh, design, which I hope you can see. But here's what I really want you to see, and if I can get here. When I'm holding this needle, it's exactly the right length for where, where my finger comes when I'm, when I'm dipping in and out of the thread. And the part past the hole fits into, my, into the palm of my hand where I can wrap my little pinky around it. What I do is when I'm stitching, if I'm dropping the needle or doing any kind of manipulation, that gives me control. And this is just something that I've learned with other looping forms over the years, that if I can control my thread using my fine motor skills without necessarily um, having to drop the needle, everything is right where I need it to be when I go. So many people don't like a needle this long. Many people don't care for uh, this much butt past the eye of the needle. But for me, it works. And so whether or not there was some kind of previous life where that's what made sense for me, I don't know. But we can go back to the, um, to the slide section now. And um, I'll show you a hat where I, I made this for my husband um, two years ago, three years ago, something like that. Um, from a commercial singles. And I'm not a big fan of singles for knoll bending, but it was really soft. And now that the, he's got a, a little bald spot on top that, that the snow piles up on, he wanted really soft. But the, the thread doesn't, uh, the singles in this merino blend did not hold up very well. I, I think the pilling makes it, um, he, he won't give it up because it's so warm, but the pilling does not reflect well on me. But then, you know, he wears raggedy cuffs and other things, too, so it's not my fault. The, what is the definition of singles? A single would be a, a spun bundle of fiber that is not plied with another, uh, uh, another thread. So a lot of uh, uh, yarns would be uh, plied, two, three, four ply, whatever. Um, and this would just be one bundle of fiber with enough twist to hold it together. Um, and the, it's not so much the singles, I think, but, I, but it's a very short fiber, a very fine fiber, the merino. Um, we, it's, it's maybe not the best to, to make it look um, crisp and new forever, but it's certainly warm. But personally, um, if you'll go to the next slide for uh, null bending, you know, I, I prefer whatever material I have. And this is something that um, many people would do. And I looked and looked and looked and to try to find my first null bending needle. And I have not treasured it like my embroidery scissors because it was awful. This one is from the collection, though, and it was hand carved from a toothbrush. Um, so you can see that the hole that the, um, the, the marking thread is through would have been used to hang it on a nail next to the sink, which is exactly how my grandparents kept their toothbrushes and carved into a point at the other end. And I did this with the toothbrush once and it was about the same length. I can't make it any longer. The hole is where it is. And it doesn't fit my hand very well. It's certainly useful though. And if you'll go to the next slide, 
um, our thrifty immigrants ancestors didn't throw anything away. Now I've read diff various reports about toothbrush looping rugs that indicate yes, they they were uh, a new world uh, construction. Basically, they're not going to throw away any piece of fabric that they have. They would they would stitch it into a rug, and it's a beautiful. There are beautiful rugs in the Vesterheim collection um, made with this technique. But I have found for myself, when I do this technique, I still prefer um, a longer needle and I, I make it heavier. Uh, the tip is, has a different profile. Um, this is this, yeah, that's go ahead, Leah. That's, um, you can go up onto that. So this would be about the the uh, profile I would be working for. And I always try to have extra needles if there's somebody who I mean, you have somebody with very small hands or hands that are challenged by um, uh, arthritis or other conditions uh, to find a tool that fits. Um, so if we go through to um, yeah, that's how I make them. I, we have my husband makes fishing nets we take waste wood we cut it into a basic shape drill a hole and then all the rest is sanding and and uh, finish work although i have made them just using a rasp um, i've made them just using a carving knife um, i've tried other techniques but um, um, it's a lot of it is just eyeballing for me nothing so elegant as the tool that's in my hand right now that Lindy uh, Lee made for, uh, uh, which was a gift from Kate, um, by the way, with the, the coal roasting. So, uh, but generally when I make a needle, it's, it's about five and a half to six and a half inches long. Um, more accurately, the width of the hand with a curled pinky near the eye and, and then shaped. Now there is another, another type of needle I find him really interest or really important for null bending um you can see on the very left on the top there's my null bending needle on the left is my uh tapestry needle and a tapestry needle is just a metal needle with a large eye and a blunt tip um i am a spitter i spit splice when i'm working with wool i spit splice but i i do have some filters left and when I need to be socially appropriate, like at the farmer's market or someplace now, and in, in a pandemic in, in public, it's probably best not to be spitting on your hand. And so I will do what's called a Russian join for applied thread. So this is another reason why I like applied thread, whether it's hands fun or commercial, because you can create that, you can Google it, Russian join, it's a, it's a great way without spitting to be able to connect an old and a new thread, because that is the hallmark of a single element construction. You, you draw the entire length of the thread through on each and every stitch, it will not unravel, and you create uh, this amazing structure, but what you wanna do is work with a manageable length of thread and then be able to add a thread on as if you never ran out. Our ancient ancestors would have just twisted on more um, in, in cordage. That's a two ply technique where you twist and ply all together. Um, but uh, for us, working from these great big balls of yarn that, that we've stashed, um, it's, uh, it's good to know how to add thread. Now, if we'll go on to the next slide here, this is another, this is, one of the things at Vesterheim that I just love to be able to see the artifacts. This is a cow tail strainer. It's a cow tail hair strainer. It's not for, for straining cow tails, but for straining milk or hops if you're brewing beer. Um, and this is part of a group of artifacts that was uh, sent in 1927, I believe, in honor of 100 years of immigration. Um, this tells so much of the story of the Nordic ancestors 
who what they what their life was like, what they left behind, and what they brought with them, and how it changed. I am a child of dairy farmer. Um, I grew up in the milk house. My grandmother actually uh, th they milked also, and she carried everything in a bucket to a small bulk tank. My dad was a modern farmer, so neither of them ever ever did anything like this where they would um, uh, have to strain out. But I've seen plenty of cows kick stuff that would have gone into a bucket. So if we can go to the next slide, that that no bending strainer would have been laid into uh, something like this wooden strainer where the X in the center would allow you to pour in milk put the strainer on top of it, pour through the milk, it would rest on top of another bucket or container, and, um, and that would, would strain out the solids. Um, or if you're brewing beer, you would pour through and the hops would stay back. Um, so I think we, is this where we have the video now? Let's, let's take a look at some of this and then we'll talk more about the materials. Um, this is the, again from the Norsk Folk Museum. Um, where she's carrying the, the milk that she has, as she just milked into that bucket. This is the strainer like the wooden one and the no bending hair, cowtail hair strainer inside. And when you see these in the museum as, as artifacts, um, it is awesome to be able to see, but when you see it, in use like this, the filmmaker gives us a great gift. <clears throat> We're, um, we have um, we have an opportunity now to talk a little bit about the preparation of those materials for that artifact and for other things. Um, this Carter was. Uh, 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 I don't know, I, I, there are a couple of artifacts in this presentation that come from the same person. Um, these belonged to Randy Han, Daughter Helgevold, uh, born 1871 in um, Rogaland and immigrated in 1901 to Iowa. Um, she kept sheep and she used the wool from those sheep for knitting and for weaving. So she would use, and I think there's another image of the hand cards. Here we go. The, the hand cards have a fine, a, a, a pattern of fine bent wires that are embedded into um, a leather uh, base that's attached to the wooden hand card there. And so let's talk a, a little bit about the preparation of materials. Um, when we're talking about cowtail hair, um, if you'll go to the next slide, please. I oh, okay. This is the uh, we're going to play this video, and this will show the um, preparation by carding of the cowtail hair. And see there, and you can imagine that this may be a different. Um, quality of fiber than what all cowtail hairs are now. But basically, he's making sure that the, the fibers are all going every which way, not like combing where everything would be aligned and the same length. And now he's gathering that um, basically onto a distaff so that the fiber is ready to come off as he spins. So there's a distaff above, he's pulling down the fiber, and then spinning it on that spindle. Um, and that's basically just providing enough uh, twist to hold everything together. This is the fiber that would have been prepared for making into the strainer that we just saw the milk being poured through. Um, now, a few years ago, uh, <laughs> we got, we got the itch to try this. Um, Kate Martinson and Emily Durkee and, and 
couple of other uh, friends of mine, we all thought, well, we ought to see if we can get some cowtail hairs, uh, which might be a little bit m more um, involved than I would have thought when when we first started talking about it. But not only cowtail hair, but the right kind of cowtail hair. So I have a young friend who is a veterinary student, and she went to her uncle's farm, and her boyfriend, uh, she and her boyfriend, who is a wonderful person too, they went and they trimmed a bunch of cowtails for me. And I washed it up and I tried a lot of different preparation methods. Um, I tried just twisting it, but it wasn't hairy enough. It didn't have enough uh, barbing action to catch anything that would go through. Um, I tried carding it with a little bit of wool. And I don't know if you can see it. Kate, are you there? Or, or did we? Um, Kate brought back from one of the Norway trips some royal cowtail hair, um, which is a, a much different consistency than what I had. I don't know if you can see me or not. Tell me if you can't see. Okay. Um, but I made, I did the best that I could. I carded it together with a little bit of wool because the, the, the hair was so slippery that I needed a little something that would, would hold things together. And if you go to the next slide then please, um, the, uh, um, I did not have, I didn't have, a, a clue on how to set up a distaff. The only time I ever set up a distaff, I was spinning basswood bark. Um, I think I did a little bit with some linen once, but the basswood bark, inner bark I was trying to spin. So we, we jury rigged a distaff with a broom handle and the donut off of my tire um, from my car. So this in lieu of, of, of really the right materials and in lieu of really the right tools, uh, I just did the best I could on my spinning wheel. And I can't say that I loved spinning it, but I created uh, a fiber that had enough uh, barbing effect to it, if you will go to the next slide, that I could at least sample the, uh, the technique that might have been used in making a strainer. And that's kind of where um, I wanted to go with this is sometimes you just don't have the right tools or you don't have time to make the right tool. Um, it's not perfect, but it is interesting to do the best you have with what you have and then kind of see how our ancestors, if you want to go to the next, um, the next slide, our ancestors created these elegant tools. This one, this is a distaff. Um, a distaff would be used uh, often, often with, with linen to um, dress the fiber so that you can easily uh, uh, draft it into the thread as you're spinning. And this distaff is um, uh, chip carved and incised and beautiful, and I kind of doubt that it was for linen, but I really don't know. I'm not, this is not my area of expertise at all. Um, what would often have been used for, for dressing fiber, uh, for, excuse me, for dressing wool, if you're going to spin um, as you walk, because you could slip it under your arm and then you have something portable because people didn't just hop on the ATV to go to the neighbors or to the field or um, wherever it was that you were going. So this, and I think we have a slide that shows the, uh, um, the carving at the end a little bit better than two. I, I love that people took the time to make their tools beautiful. For those of you who, who sew or embroider and have studied anything at all about uh, historic costume, you know that often uh, those traditional designs had a very important role in protecting the wearer. And I feel like the same is true when they've um, carved a tool, they're, they're adding some good mojo, some, some absolute prayers for 
the the end user um beautiful additions to tools it wasn't frivolous at all it was meant to make the world a better place and these tools certainly do um we have one more artifact i want to show here um oh excuse me two of them this is the i you can see most of the tools that i selected were pretty you know not rustic but 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 not the elegance that you that you get with this this is a knitter's hook um, the belt clasp in the form of a hand there on the left hand side if you can see that and then the anchor um, on on the other side brought from from norway by um elizabeth corin in 1851 her family said that when they donated it that she used it her entire life and people would would knit and walk, uh, walk and knit, uh, hands always moving. But you have a beautiful tool here that I doubt if she, maybe she did wear this when she was milking, but, um, but definitely on the walk to Sunday services um, or, or wherever where her hands were busy and, and going. The, the last artifact that I want to share is the um, knitting needles. And I just absolutely fell in love with these needles. Um, these are bone with the tops tipped in what appears to be red sealing wax, where they would seal a letter. Um, these were also acquired from Randy Hagevold, whose carters we saw earlier. Um, they came with two balls of two-ply wool, one undyed brown and one dyed red. Um, the wool was from family sheep raised near Clarion, Iowa, and in her family history, she knit stockings, scarves, and mittens from the fleeces that she raised. Can you imagine what life was like, and I'm so grateful that things are, have been saved from people who did not have a local yarn shop with um, 17 different sizes of needles so that you could match the gauge of a designer who used a very specific type of, of uh, uh, wool for it to work out. She matched her knitting to the wool that she had, what she had from her sheep, what she spun, and uh, probably made these needles herself and put the end on them with the red sealing wax that she had. It reminds us that we can be um, a, a little bit more creative sometimes in our tools. There's always a best tool for the job, but when the tools match the materials, and these probably matched her spinning perfectly for the weight of wool that she mostly spun and mostly used for making those uh, stockings knit uh, scarves and uh, and mittens, and so materials drive tool design. So you use what you have, use what's available. Um, think about how you can do that, and let's just really savor a moment of of gratitude and awe for those immigrant ancestors and and the ancient ancestors who taught us that we don't really always have to have a million different things to do one thing and do it well. I'm very grateful that we have collections like this to study and and for the example of the people who went before um, who continue to inspire us.